Um, you know, now we've gotten to the part in the program where we're going to do some uh, questions and answers and let, uh, let our panel just answer spontaneously. Um, but I, I guess I, I have one to start, if you don't mind. Um, all of you seem especially inspired and engaged in what you're doing. And usually there are key events. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Jesse Kip Thorne's book was up on the... Uh, up on the screen, um, and it may have been one thing or a series of things that I, I'm, I'm wondering. Um, you know, we just start with Jesse because you you did take the initiative to 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 say that you enjoyed the popular science books. Were there any particular events that that got you any observations or events that that got you started in optics in particular? So I'll say yeah. Is like I. I think there are more a number of events, you know, it's kind of mm -hmm. a little bit of a random walk, um, a career trajectory. So you'll get started in one direction and then something will move you along. Um, so for me, I don't know how I got my hands on my first physics book, but I was hooked by then. When I was a kid, um, I was going to be a cosmologist. That was what I wanted to do, study black holes. Um, then there was a time in, in college when I first stepped into my, into my first lab and I thought, oh, wait a second, maybe I don't want to sit with pencil and paper. This is what I want to do. I want to tinker all day. Um, and then... Um, also, just seeing the technology march through um, our world, you know, as I got older, moving from bulky personal computers to now cell phones, um, sort of uh, over time, that sort of made me think, you know what, this is what I want to contribute to. Um, and that's what got me into industry. Yeah, good. Nozomi, did you have any particular mentors? You mentioned your life partner, right? And yes. is, is that how you got into optics, per se? Yeah, so um, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that was a, a big part of it, but um, um, one of the most important things is that um, I had an undergrad advisor who was actually um, my partner's ad uh, graduate advisor as well, Eric Mazur, who is a fantastic scientist, but also is engaged in all sorts of um, other levels of, of um, outreach and education. And he's, he's one of the people that made me realize that um, it really isn't just about the lab. Things that you can do in, in the lab can have such an impact well beyond what you actually do. And so I think he was a, a key um, in, in shaping the way um, I think about it. And also, he was a key in making sure that this was a great and enjoyable process for everyone. And that was really important. Yeah, Eric is an exceptional individual. He's just been elected uh, to the presidential chain at the Optical Society, so uh, you'll probably be seeing more of him. He has made many uh, impacts, not just in physics, but also in teaching methods um, for many years. I think maybe some of you have heard about Eric, and you'll be hearing much more. Um, thank you. Um, how about... You know, Meredith, how about you? Did uh, yes, I actually remember specific moments in my childhood where I was playing with prisms and rainbows <laughs> um, and magnifying glasses, and then there was a gap until, you know, I was, I was one of those people, not as, uh, as young as Jesse, but I, I did tour colleges when I think I was in middle school, um, <laughs> and my mom uh, was a chemical engineer and mechanical engineer, and so she would bring home pictures, you know, scanning electron, microscope mm -hmm. images, and mm -hmm. so forth, and I said, oh, wow, that's really cool. So I thought I wanted to go into material science. I got to Stanford, realized that the undergrad material science uh, program was, you know, three graduates a year, and I kind of felt that wow. I wanted to have a more diverse... Um, you know, uh, mafia to engage with uh, during undergrad, and so found electrical engineering as a place where it was so broad, there were so many different aspects that I could dive into, whether it was software or hardware or devices, but uh, I actually designed my own major because they didn't have photonics um, and uh, electronics as a concentration, so I did an individually designed um, specific a specific path for photonics, but now they saw the error of their ways, and it's one of the standard there you go. Uh, paths. That's at the Ginston Lab? Uh, so the Ginston Lab was one of the few labs that did not have an individually designed concentration for undergrad associated with it at the time. And you changed that. We've got some <laughs> change makers here. <laughs> All right, good. Are there any questions before I pile on? I've got a whole list of questions I'd like to ask these young ladies, but are there any questions from the group here? Yes, that is a great question. Um, 
I completely agree that sometimes the resources and the mission uh, have a mismatch. I mean, if you look at Homeland Security on paper, it's uh, very simple, secure the homeland. That's two words. Um, in implementation, it can be very difficult, especially if you're looking at things where you need to be visionary and, you know, what does the first responder in 50 years look like? Um, you know, there's a lot of research and development that goes into making us prepared, um, you know, for the coming decades. Uh, so I don't know if there's a, a silver bullet answer to how to get that mismatch um, fixed, uh, but to the extent that we can, leveraging the innovations that are going on in academia and in industry, you know, I personally have no uh, desire to reinvent the wheel. So if there's something out there that we can leverage in industry and academia, um, you know, or any other sector, let's do that um, and try to find an effective way to use the taxpayers' dollars so that we provide the best level of service that we can uh, given the, you know, practical constraints. Um, Ma'am? Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, so, um, um, unlike my colleagues here, I, um, I actually wanted to be a ballet dancer when I grew up. Um, and so, um, um, and, and that didn't quite work out for me, but I, I've, I've landed quite well. Um, so, one of the things that has um, been a little bit frustrating and intimidating is is the fact that um, um, there aren't actually that many people that have forged their path in a way that you know is very different from like a model of, of how you go forward um, in um, in this career um, let me let me actually revise that so so you're actually told that there is sort of a, a straight and narrow path um, often on how um, maybe you get into these technical fields, science, or there's a very narrow sort of perception of uh, who a scientist, who an engineer is going to be. Um, and um, even though um, I, I started to love science, um, you know, in, as, as, as sort of a teenager, um, dealing with that mismatch is probably some of the things that I still deal with today that maybe I'm not quite... Um, Quite, quite the person that should be doing this. Um, I have to say, though, um, <laughs> what actually, what actually happens um, and keeps me going is that um, there's moments when I start to think about what I do, I think about the people that I'm interacting with, and I forget that. And so that's really what's been been carrying me through. Um, it's the excitement and the of, uh, the exploration. But every once in a while. Um, it does. It does come up, and I think it comes up for a lot of people that maybe maybe this isn't the the mold that they fit. Is there is there a sense that you know when I when I was going through graduate school and so on, there was a book out that um, basically said that if you want to be a woman in science, you basically you you can't have a life. You you're going to be working all day through the night. You don't don't even think about hobbies or anything like that. Do you do you all have a sense of that now, or is it is, are things changing? I guess what, one thing I would say, and I, I heard someone say this once, and it, it really struck me, um, is that rather than being a work life balance, uh, it seems to be more like a work life seesaw. Um, <laughs> you know, sometimes there is just a lot to get done, and and you kind of, I mean, I I want to throw myself in, in my work. I think it's very exciting, and you know, at those times when there's some deadline, when the project is going really well, when you have an experiment that has to be done continuously, then uh, then yeah, the seesaw swings one way, and and um. And then other times, you know, right after that, you're tired, you know, or maybe something's going on in your personal life, then it, it kind of swings the other way. And I would say over time, it averages out. Um, and I do try to structure my life such that these seesaw swings are, are functional with the way I do things. Um, mm -hmm. But that kind of helps me to get through, as I know when it's swinging one way, well, pretty soon it'll swing the other. So I don't know, is it, Nozomi, I mean, having been an academic myself, I mean, it just, it, it easily gets to a point where it never stops. Are you able to, to mediate that a lot? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I learned is um, on the way up that to foster, I think, a creative and innovative environment, you, d you definitely have to take that time. Um, so even with um, the people that are in the lab, the students and things, we actually try to build some of the fun in. So we've done things like snowboarding trips, we've done hiking trips, and that sort of thing. So um, um, yeah, so I definitely have 
um, all of that. And that, that's one of the real nice things, I think, about academia is that it isn't just about um, working. It is about developing the people and the relationships. And that's, um, that's where I get a, a lot of the, the release. And a lot of that's done in the, in the snow and in the nice um, wildlife <laughs> um, and the nice parks and things all around uh, Ithaca. Uh, Meredith, you're, you're nodding your head a lot. Yes, um, definitely resonate with all of those points. Actually, the whole work-life balance thing, OSA and the student chapter at Stanford taught me a lot about that because I was always one of those very driven, and I guess I would argue that I still am, uh, you know, results-oriented, let's, you know, have this outline of what we're going to do and you know what you're going to accomplish by the end of that meeting. Um, and then my, my uh, co-conspirator, Tom Sullivan, who later became uh, chapter president right after me, um, he was much more of a, oh, well, let's, you know, do the social aspect, see how everyone's doing before we dive into, uh, you know, the nitty gritty and what we're trying to accomplish. And so it was wonderful being able to work closely with him. I remember Kiki Latalian, who was in charge of the student chapters, um, told us, you know, way back, uh, dating myself probably 2003 or so, that the most important thing you can do as a leader is to find your replacement. And so I found a great replacement in Tom, and he taught me so much. And it was, you know, those, those moments that I remember the fondest, you know, in terms of my graduate career were the ones that were involved with people um, and really having that balance to, you know, take that time for reflection, mm -hmm. uh, step off the gas a little bit so that in the long run you have this sustained output and a much more enjoyable experience at the end of the day. But you're kind of talking about two things. There's the reflection on what you're doing and the impact it's going to have and so on. But there's also all this networking. And, you know, I, all three of you have been very engaged in OSA from an early stage in your careers. I mean, how's that, how's that affected your, I mean, Jesse, you said something about um, how it has helped you connect with other folks and understand what might be important in the future uh, because you're noticing trends and so on. And, and Meredith, you also mentioned uh, a few things. How, 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 tell me a little bit more about how being involved in OSA, how did you get started with it, first of all? Yeah, I guess it was, uh, I mean, very early on in my career. So, well, in, in graduate school, um, actually starting, maybe not that, that early, but uh, mm -hmm. even just the first conference I went to, I remember just being so overwhelmed. There are all these rooms, everybody's talking about interesting <laughs> things. I could go learn about anything I want. Um, <laughs> And just that perspective, being able to finally see, oh, well, here's my area. And my area is so small compared to everything else that everybody is doing, especially in optics, which is such a broad field. Um, and then going on, as I started to become involved in conference committees and peer review, um, and especially just recently, I became an associate editor reading many, many papers that come mm -hmm. through. Um, that's been exciting because you get to see really, okay, what's, what's the pulse of the field? What's new? What's coming out? What's exciting? Um, but you spend a lot of time doing it. I mean, I... Is it worth it? I mean, that's, that's a lot of your time. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of time. I mean, I, to me, it's been an honor um, to be able to participate in these things. I think there's, again, it's maybe a seesaw. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll do some things that are very time intensive for a while, and then hopefully I'll take a break for a little bit and, um, and focus more on my research. It's, it's a matter of balancing these commitments. But yeah. uh, it's helped me grow so much as a researcher, especially early in my career now, um, that I'm, I'm really glad to be doing it. Good, good. Yeah, I would say it's been a real resource for me as well. Um, I'm now putting a lot of time into um, the um, program chair position for the next um, uh, Frontiers in Optics meeting. And it's just been a fantastic opportunity to actually learn about and meet um, an amazing cohort of people and also have the opportunity also to reach out to um, other communities. And, um, and um, it's, it's a great network to have. Yeah. And, and you're very interdisciplinary, I, I can't help but notice. I think that's the yeah. future. I really yeah. think it's the future. How, how is it different, you know, the field of optics, um, which is very physics-oriented, but you're also very involved in the neuroscience community. How, how is that different? How, how, do you, how do you manage these two different communities and, and the interface between them? Yeah, so um, there's actually a huge neuroscience uh, meeting in D.C. Uh, mm -hmm. going on right now. Um, Actually, uh, the field of neuroscience has a great tradition of people coming in from the optics field and developing tools, um, both on, on sort of the experimental side, but also on, um, on, the, uh, on the computational side. Um, and, and it is um, somewhat about um, learning to communicate and interacting with, with, with these different um, groups of people. And um, um, 
I, I would say that's the fun of it. Um, but also as an educator, I see sort of an opportunity and, um, and a burden as well that um, going forward, uh, a lot of the people that are going to be dealing with the future problems are going to be at this interface of lots of different technologies and things. Yeah, it's very complex. But also, different communities have different cultures, too. Yes, yeah. So is, for me, it's been immersion. Like, mm -hmm. you go and meet, meet people. And, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that, for me, is, is really fun, having this, this perspective that you get to learn from all of these other people and then also have a contribution to all of these other people. I mean, that's sort of been the core of the way I've gone forward. And I think the way um, a, lot of, a lot of academic and scientific pursuits are going to go forward, and I think probably in business and now in government as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just about to ask Meredith, uh, based on uh, culture, if you will, and I think Mike Duncan was referring yeah. to that in, in some, some ways as well. How do, you, how do you, you know, you come, all of you come from research backgrounds, right? And um, that's a very different, you're, you got a lot on your shoulders, you're networking with people a lot, but you're diving deep into something, uh, and you're the first one there. When you work in government, it's a very different enterprise. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. So in the 15 months that I've been here, mm. I've definitely been immersed. I've always been a learn-by-doing person. And so getting you know that seat at the government table and figuring out how things piece together, realizing that you know in D.C. and in government, um, you know, often the currency is attention. So if you can't explain the bottom line in two sentences, you are out of time sometimes. Yeah. Um, and that's something that, you know, as a scientist and, and an engineer, everyone says, oh, yeah, you need to do your elevator pitch. But can you really do your elevator pitch? <laughs> um, you know, and can you do it? And you might not have an elevator. You might have, you know, opening the door and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the culture is, is different. But, you know, at certain um, organizations like, you know, the ARPAs of the world, you actually can get that depth and that, you know, strategic research as well as the broader perspective and that tie into, you know, what is this doing to our mission? Um, and so that's where I figured it was the best of both worlds, being able to essentially do a postdoc in computer science and look at all of this really cool stuff going on with data centers, looking at things with internet of things and sensors, but still get an eye on policy and sort of the broader implications as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's been some adjustment, but I would say that there's enough of us, you know, through the AAAS Fellowship or other, um, you know, communities like the ideation community of practice uh, who are familiar with this type of open thinking and flat organization startup environment that, you know, things are getting, uh, you know, shook up a little bit to, uh, to my happiness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, ma'am. I guess one thing I'll say is that uh, everyone has always been pretty willing to talk to me, um, both women and men, in fact. You know, it's, it's at least in my experience, um, people have really wanted to help me out. Um, I would say that's, that's been a benefit to being a woman. Now, I'm sure people are also very helpful to up-and-coming young men, but, um, but I do think the doors have been really open. Uh -huh. You know, I had never really thought about it that way. Like, um, um, uh, the perk is that I get to do the science, and, and uh, that's, that's sort of the reward. <laughs> so I hadn't really thought about um, it as, as sort of, it is, it is what I want to do, and that's, that's the, my story, I think. <laughs> Um, I think it can be a double-edged sword. I think, uh, you know, I, growing up in electrical engineering, I would have classes where you could count the number of female students on one hand, uh, the number of professors, probably that same hand, you have enough fingers left. <laughs> um, and, you know, luckily that is that has grown and it's changed a little bit, but, um, you know, in certain areas, you'll be noticed because you might be the only person with long hair in the room or the only person who's wearing something colorful. Um, and so there is this burden of, you know, whatever I say, is that representing all women in science and all women in engineering? Um, so, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses and extra pressure, I guess, um, in some sense. But I've also, you know, been lucky to have lots of mentors um, who were willing to speak with me, whether that was because I was a woman or, or not, I'm not exactly sure. But, uh, you know, it's, can't really change what I am. So, uh, yeah. you know, I will go forward as a woman in science and as an engineer who is a woman. 
I've definitely op- um, benefited from opportunities like this where um, people have wanted to to highlight um, this thing. So one of the other things that I had um, was um, a L'Oreal uh, Fellowship for Women in Science. That, um, that was an excellent um, opportunity and um, a fantastic career development. Um, I probably have a, a uh, so I've got a runway. My fellowship ends um, uh, <laughs> at the end of the summer, and so it's definitely on my mind. I think um, it's been a really enlightening experience as a AAAS uh, Science and Technology Policy Fellow to see government because I'd been in academia for a really long time for all of the degrees and the postdocs, um, and I really enjoyed uh, my time in industry interning at you know numerous research labs um, and different companies. Um, and had thought about nonprofits too, so I just sort of tried everything um, to see, um, you know, what really um, drives me moving forward. And I think it's carving something out where I can work with all of those different stakeholders, um, being able to understand what makes government tick, what makes academics tick, um, you know, pulling in the advantage of industry, um, and then throwing in nonprofits and other organizations in there. You can get a lot done when you can convene, um, you know, all of those different groups and put things together in unconventional ways. Uh, for the Civic Hardware Hackathon that I mentioned, uh, it was DHS, Science and Technology, FEMA, Intel, a social innovation group called The Feast, and a design and innovation firm, IDEO. Um, and, you know, when I told people this is these are the people who are co-hosting this hackathon, they said, wow, how did you get all of those people together? Um, and it's that... Um, you know, opportunity to mix between all of the different sectors that really excites me. So hopefully it'll be something along those lines, but if you have any leads, please let me know. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I think one of the, the really important um, things that's going on is that um, the appreciation of te- technology like optics and science is spreading to, or hopefully spreading to, a much, much bigger crowd. Um, so I think in the future I've... Um, going to build on the realization that a lot of this progress comes from um, educating not just the new students but also a broader segment of of people, general public, government, business. And uh, I think so a lot of the work that I will do will um, hopefully be on making that, that, um, that broad audience all mesh together and come together in a, in a productive way. So Meredith and Jesse are going to help a lot in that. <laughs> In the back. Yeah, so let me talk a little bit more about that. So I, I, um, I um, had excellent mentors and excellent advice and chose not to take any of that. Um, so um, um, I, I chose to do my postdoc in, in, the, in the lab of both my partner and someone that I'd worked with for a very long time. And uh, one of the reasons I had done that was that there were all these opportunities in terms of science questions that were just waiting to be done. And, 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 um, and I felt like this was a time to actually do it. But in terms of um, what that means for um, um, science in general is I think this is actually a potter, pattern that is emerging more and more is that um, people are in the sciences and interested um, and and they work with with the people around them and um, to really take advantage of all the talent that is out there I don't think we can put up any artificial barriers in between who who does what um, so I'd like to say that Cornell has been really really supportive Cornell engineering um, has been, um, um, I think, very progressive in the way that they, they sort of um, have started to understand that um, to really tap into the full potential of everyone out there, there's lots of different models of how this is going to go forward. Um, one of the big advantages for me personally as a researcher and a pre-tenure um, uh, faculty member is that this has let me explore a fascinating, wide topic, um, broad range of topics. Um, and so um, um, the way the, the lab is sort of defined is that there are, um, there, there's lots of different projects, and some of those are collaborative um, with uh, Chris Schaefer, uh, but a lot of those are collaborative with a, a lot of other people. Um, and um, so there's some overlap in, in some of the things that we do. There is a huge amount of overlap in the resources that we tap into in terms of equipment, that sort of thing. Um, um, and there's some shared grants and projects and things, but what it, it, what it really is 
happening is that this is a way to sort of expand the breadth of um, what we could do. So it's interesting. I just heard uh, about advice not taking, but uh, just before uh, we sat down together, I also heard a story from Meredith about advice not taken. <laughs> it seems to be a, a, a theme emerging here. What, can you tell us a little bit about that, Meredith? Uh, sure. I was told uh, partway through my PhD that uh, you know maybe I should consider not spending so much time with the Optical Society of America, um, buckle down, and graduate. Um, I was lucky to have had two uh, stackable fellowships and uh, really the uh, you know support from my PhD advisor who saw the value in collaborating with these other uh, optics researchers and building up something that is greater than you know what any lab could do on its own and so um, you know I was glad that I didn't take that advice either I am always you know open to listening but um, you know ended up choosing the path that felt right for me and, and realizing that, hey, yes, it is hard and there are some days where, you know, it's like starting a startup, you know, to get uh, all these people to, to move forward together, but it was worth it in the end. So definitely uh, keep an open mind with any advice that comes in your door. Yeah, well, I, I think generally mentors are well-meaning, but uh, mentors have their own experiences, right, and you're forging your own. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you... You, you've all uh, got brilliant careers very early on. Um, what you're most proud of so far? I'm most proud of keeping an open mind because when I was interviewing for this AAAS uh, fellowship, I went and gave a talk that was, you know, on my thesis work at the FDA. Um, I had actually told Tom Bayer, a longtime mentor. Um, and director of the Stanford Photonics Research Center, um, you know, Tom had said, oh, Meredith, you'd be really good at this Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. And I said, I don't know, it sounds like DC is having some problems getting things done. I don't know if that's really the environment that I want to, you know, go, go into. Um, then I read a little bit more and saw that, you know, I could be placed in an executive branch agency. Those agencies included the Department of Defense, uh, you know, DHS, USAID, the Agency for International Development. And I came here fully thinking that I was going to, you know, take a detour and do international development, um, you know, at USAID. And this was the week of the Boston bombing. We had gone through, you know, four days of interviews, and DHS was pretty busy that week. But they posted on, you know, Thursday evening an opening. I saw it, and I said, wow, that's the shortest one. It seems really interesting. I could learn a lot there. It seems pretty technical. Um, and I just sent an email interviewed with my now current boss, um, and the rest is history. But if I hadn't kept an open mind, if I had said, well, I already know that all of these groups are going to have offers for me, and I'm set in this path, um, it could be a very, very different story. Yeah, I guess I'll say, I mean, this is a pretty simple thing to say, but uh, to me, the thing I'm most proud of is when that device that you designed from the very beginning, you went on the computer, you did the simulations, um, you, you fabricated it yourself in the lab, you plug it in, uh, to the experimental setup, you turn on that laser and it works the way you predict. I mean, that's what keeps me coming back to science. That's uh, what I find very exciting. That's very, very exciting. How about you, Nizam? Um, I would say the thing that I've been most proud of is sort of related to the, this idea that um, um, you, you take risks and, and you go new, new paths. Um, so scientifically, um, I, I started out in optics and femtosecond laser physics. Um, and so the thing that, I, that has been most exciting for me is that um, we've used this tool to break into a couple new different fields. So for example, blood flow in the brain and neuroscience, and then now the, the, um, the field of uh, Alzheimer's research is a whole different field. So um, I'm really excited by, by the idea that we have been able to um, repeatedly go and, um, and make, forge new paths, explore new ideas. Okay, good. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so that's a good question. How do you deal with um, crossing fields and, and um, building new directions? So I have to say, it didn't actually take me a short time. Um, it actually took quite a long time. And my postdoc and, and th these kinds of trainings were a little bit longer than um, probably are typical, um, but I would say worth it. And um, most of, most of um, um, sort of the progress in the learning really was connecting with people um, that were excited about what they were doing and would be willing to talk to you about it and um, sort of immersing yourself in the community and 
and learning from um, the experts. And, and, and really what drove all that or what um, smoothed all that out is that people are really excited about what they do. And, they, um, and then when you, when, you, when you make that connection and talk to people and, and talk to someone that doesn't know what you've done in the past, um, there's sort of um, a sort of a spark of, uh, of innovation that I think comes from that cross-disciplinary uh, tie. Yeah, very good. Just a quick show of hands in the audience. How many people here are connected to optics in some way, either through their education or some other part of their career path? Quite a few. How about physics in general, physics, engineering in general? Yeah, quite a, quite a few. Well, listen, thank you very much for coming. Um, one of our panelists has to scoot off to the White House, so we don't want to delay that. Um, but what we do have is um, a very nice little treat for everybody, a um, chance to interact. Uh, Liz, would you like to? Sure. I would like to um, uh, thank the panelists for joining this Rising Star event, um, Nozomi, uh, Jesse, and Meredith. Uh, you have hit the pause button and uh, joined us to educate us in your experience, and we so appreciate that. And of course, I'd like to thank Susan for, uh, she's busy running a company, and she was willing to come down here when she heard about the program and uh, help facilitate the conversation. And for the staff who helped support this, uh, where's Gail? She's in the back. Uh, Gail Mamatova, uh, Christina uh, Burmeister, um, Michael Haymore and Gary Stoiber has been um, uh, really gracious in helping us yesterday and today and uh, consultant Aideen Tosk for helping organize this. So please join me in thanking all the presenters. Thank you.